it's time for our football IQ segment that we have grown to love as this just in sometimes football coaches uh, make bad decisions in case you didn't know. So uh, we will get to that right now. Now, did you see any on the message board? Did you see any coaching maneuvers over the weekend that you were just like, what the H and you can go ahead and uh, put that up there and we'll be glad to address those. So basically uh, we're going to go ahead and tell you that they're really uh, smart, but they have, uh, different levels of dumbness. One is that's crazy, Tracy Morgan, and the other is a little bit stronger, and that is you suck. Yeah, suck <laughs> <laughs> Never gets old. I don't know why that makes us all giggle. We're grown men. All right, here we go. Uh, Caleb, do you want to start with us? What do you got in our football IQ segment? Well, I would like two honorable mentions before I start because, and the reason I want to do two honorable mentions is because I usually reserve these for coaches who cost their team games with these decisions. But there's one coach who was incredibly stupid with a decision, but he got lucky and won. But I'm like, he still should be called out even though you won. And so I want to start that with Mario Cristobal of Miami. And I know we piled on him two weeks ago when he deserved it, but this time Miami had the ball at the 38 yard line score tied in regulation, two timeouts and a minute and a half to go. And Cristobal played for overtime. Now he needed, he has one of the best kickers in college football. He needed maybe 25 yards to get a field goal. And he played for overtime. Now he won in overtime, but you go for the, you play for the win in that situation always. And so he deserves to be called out even though he won. So that's my first honorable mention. John, he still won. So what level of dumbness are you giving that? Um, yeah, it's some level. I mean, it's not the most flagger because he did win the game and maybe, uh, I don't know what it went into his thinking. It's not as bad as some of his other decisions. So, um, I don't so know. Just him kind on the of curve a... of himself. Yeah, we'll just go <laughs> with this level. That's crazy. Um, yeah, and... that's crazy. That's good. Yeah, that's crazy. And a crystal ball is terrible. Travis says, I, I have to admit. I was so high on Cristobal about five years ago. I thought he was going to be the best coach, and I was dead a wrong. All right, Caleb, what do we got next? All right, so the ne this is not an on-field one. This is an off-field one. I don't think the Michigan cheating scandal is a big deal, but the scalp that bought the tickets to the opposing team's game in his own name, <laughs> so they got oh. caught. That's how they're getting caught. I'm deeming that one right now. You suck. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, Jeremy Pruitt would have at least had his wife buy the tickets. Yeah. Um, yes. John, okay. that, that whole the, the Michigan thing is bizarre to me because do you know what opposing uh, high school coaches do when they have an off weekend? They go scout the other team. Um, why is why the hell is that? A, excuse my language. Why is that even a rule? No, to me, it's uh, just uh, thorough coaching and uh, <laughs> evaluating the opposition. But boy, it's. Uh, it not it's not going over well. It's almost like there's a lynch mob out to get Jim Harbaugh one way or the other. I think there is because he's flirted he's flirted so much with the NFL. I think they've about had enough of it. And it's ironic that Michigan has, I believe, the best team in college football this year. But we'll see. Caleb points out they haven't played anybody, which is true. All right, Caleb, what is, what's up next? And uh, right, so I hate now, to say, it, guys, but Josh Heupel is going to make this list. Yes, and we will save Josh Heupel towards the top. So the first like one in the game to call the team. Kenny Dillingham, I called him out two weeks ago, the Arizona State coach. I'm calling him out again. Up 7-3 to three in the fourth quarter. It was third and 10. Washington, off an incomplete pass, Washington, I'm sorry, Arizona State forced to third and 10 in the red zone. Dillingham did one of these things that drives me crazy that coaches do. He lined up, he saw the offense, and then he called a timeout because he wanted to see what the formation looked like. Well, you might. Well, guess what? Arizona State needed that timeout at the end of the game when Washington was able to run the clock out. I don't get the calling a timeout because you want to see the formation. The other team's just going to change their formation for the next time they come out. I think it's stupid. I think it's dumb. And it cost him late in the game because he didn't have a timeout that would have stopped the clock and given them the ball back if he had that timeout. John, that whole take a look at the defense and call a timeout. That seems like that's single wing stuff. That seems like that's 50 years old. Uh, it's almost one of those things like uh, let's ice the kicker, 
one of those things that started and everybody said, oh, you got to do that. Because if you don't, then everybody will say, well, why didn't you ice the kicker? So, yeah, you got to call a timeout there. It's interesting. I watched I watched the game uh, Caleb was referring to just as I watched the game the previous week where, or maybe it was two weeks ago when I was watching Arizona playing. Um, maybe I can't even remember who Arizona was playing, USC, but it was. Right? A, yeah, it was USC. And I thought Arizona should have won the game. And uh, Arizona State, I don't think Arizona State's won, but one game. And it was out playing Washington for parts of that game and had a great chance to win. And yeah, th that kind of decision making down the stretch was not good at all. All right. So I'm going to give that. Uh, the, uh, and because I can't imagine the head coach of the defensive coordinator said, all right, they took a timeout. So, uh, um, let's just, uh, they know what we're going to do. Let's run the same thing out there. I can't imagine somebody doing that. No. Well, no, they would think, oh, they think we're going to switch to something else, but we'll come back with the same thing. <laughs> oh, double, See? the double sneakeroo. Yeah. This is that football Jedi IQ that we don't trick. understand. <laughs> yeah. Jedi mind trick or yeah. He was like, they're playing checkers. We're playing chess. Yes. These are not the droids you're looking for. <laughs> yeah. it's a huge you suck <laughs> never gets old all right caleb let's get to josh hype all right um oh we want to do josh hype now okay well oh, we, can do okay, we can do another one if you want all right, I, got, I got a few more actually that i'll just have to run through real quick uh you guys can this one may not be as bad but i thought mac brown north carolina and their loss to virginia they got inside the red zone brought up a first and ten Drake may played well, but Amari and Hampton averaged six yards a carry in that game. They threw it four straight times. You got to run it one time in the red zone at that point. That was like Butch Jones, 2017 Florida, not running it with John Kelly when they got inside the 15 yard line and Florida was tired. So calling four straight passes was just next level stupid. All right. Well, I, I think it depends on the look. So I'll just give that a. That's crazy. All right. So uh, let's get to Josh Hype. One more before Hype, and then we'll get to one him, more but... before Hype. You guys may disagree with me, but Hugh Freeze punting on fourth and one near midfield against Ole Miss in the second half. Um, it was a 14-14 game. Ole Miss has an elite quarterback and an elite offensive coach in Jackson Dart and Lane Kiffin. I, I believe in Hugh Freeze, but I think you go for it in that situation because you're outmatched playing a very good offense in Ole Miss. John, thoughts? Caleb does not believe punting should ever be called. I, I don't. <laughs> I There are I, I There are hot. I was the one guy, do you remember when Bill Belichick went for it and didn't get it against the Colts 15 mm. years ago? And everyone's like, that was a bad call. I was firmly on Belichick's side because I guaranteed everybody that had he not, that had he got, had he punted it, Peyton Manning was going to go down the field and score anyway. I agree. Yeah, I agree in that case, but I think it's got to depend on your personnel, the, you know, tone of the game, that kind of thing. Yeah. I think Caleb yeah. would just shoot the punter right in the leg before. The yeah. Game. He, he was. Yeah, he thinks they should all be cripples before <laughs> kickoff, so they can't punt. All right. Uh, let's get uh, to the hype pool in our football IQ segment. So I have no problem with going forward, as you guys know, on fourth and inches. I have a problem with fourth and inches not calling a quarterback sneak. And I don't know why coaches haven't. You have a six foot five, 240 pound quarterback. This goes back to practice. My guess is they don't practice it. Why don't you practice the QB sneak once a day? Just so, like, you can do it. Because how many teams now are – and you're seeing this in the NFL. Do you guys realize how bad red zone offenses are in the NFL right now? Teams are losing games because they're not converting fourth and one or fourth and two. Those were gimmies 20 years ago. And now they're not. And it's driving me crazy because I think the problem is they're not practicing plays under center. John, how bad did you uh, dislike uh, – how much did you dislike that? that call on fourth down. I, you, you mentioned it earlier. I thought that was trying to force an issue. Yeah. That's just, uh, I just don't like it when you've lost the momentum and you try to force something. I, I just don't think it, it's the appropriate thing. Be patient. And as much as Caleb hates it, uh, gain some field position. Um, uh, and, you know, and then you can, yeah, the, the play call, I mean, it was bad all around in my mind. I wouldn't have gone for it. And I said that I was like, no, don't do that. And then the play itself was, it was not a good call. I didn't think, but you can debate that. I just, uh, I want the quarterback under center. If you're going to do that. Yep. 
Um, but there he's Josh Heupel's not the only guy that does that. Some coaches just don't believe of getting out of the shotgun. That's their that's their thing, and they want to stay in the shotgun regardless of down and distance. I'd rather throw the ball. I'd rather even throw the ball if you're if you're determined. I'm serious. If you're determined to go out a shotgun, I I, I, I run a slant, do something, um, see how hard Joe Milton can throw it at somebody. <laughs> <laughs> Orange Bud says Hypo would rather lose his left hand than go under center. I don't That's know if he's true. left. He did it twice right last hand. year. He did it three times last year. He did. We are really charting the punt opportunities. And as far as Caleb's thoughts on punters, Smoky Mountain Red says Tanya Harding them. Why? Why? There, there's John. Well, there's, why me? I, there's why one me? more. There is one more punt situation that I think I can get John and Dave on my side for, for this one. I because it. I hate this one. Arkansas, Mississippi State. It was fourth and one from the Mississippi State 33 yard line. And Sam Pittman decided, let me take a delay of game and then punt the ball. Well, yeah, that was incredibly stupid. That that calls for a Dave. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. That's crazy. Or that one? Steven, oh. you no, suck. no, yes, worse than I that. Got... There you go. <laughs> yeah. It, Sam Pittman and to compound things. After the game, he just said, I just didn't know what to do there. <laughs> I just didn't know what to do there. Yeah. That's on yeah, me. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, Sam Pittman has uh, coached his way onto the hot seat after being a beloved coach at Arkansas for a couple of seasons. Um, he he made the, uh, a veteran coaching move by firing his offensive coordinator, you know, Get rid of him so everybody will say, yeah, Dan Enos is a problem, not you. But then he made just an egregious uh, decision by saying, huh, I had no clue what to do in that situation. I didn't know, should I kick it, go for it? And then I just, I don't know, I just froze. I mean, how bad can you be? You almost could have fired him right then. Do you know why Sam Pittman is so lovable? Because he's a big guy? <laughs> That's probably a factor. But also, he'll pick up the phone for any interview. We could probably have him on tomorrow. I mean, it, why don't you call him right now and get him on the podcast? All right, let's go ahead and dial that up. <laughs> <laughs>